You're listening to Conversations in Atlantic Theory, a podcast dedicated to books and ideas generated from and about the Atlantic world. In collaboration with the Journal of French and Francophone Philosophy, these conversations explore the cultural, political, and philosophical traditions of the Atlantic world, ranging from European critical theory to the Black Atlantic, to sites of indigenous resistance and self-articulation, as well as the complex geography of thinking between traditions, inside traditions, and from positions of insurgency, critique, and counter-narrative. Today's discussion is with Yomaira Figueroa Vasquez, who teaches in the Department of English at Michigan State University in Lansing, Michigan. She publishes widely in Afro-Atlantic studies, with particular emphasis on Hispanophone Africa and the Americas, as well as co-curating with Jessica Marie Johnson, the digital project collective, Electric Maronage. We are discussing today her book, Decolonizing Diasporas, Radical Mappings of Afro-Atlantic Literature, which was published in late 2020 by Northwestern University Press and was the winner of the MLA Prize in United States Latina and Latino and Chicana and Chicano Literary and Cultural Studies. Yomaira, how are you? I'm doing good, John. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm so glad uh, you made the time to talk about your book. I did want to say at the beginning, uh, I really love this book. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, beautifully written. I think it has a lot of really interesting vision to it, and that's part of what we'll get into. Um, and it's one of those books, as I was reading, I kept thinking to myself how much I was learning in addition to being like a really uh, scholarly, you know, making arguments around concepts I work with and so forth. But there's just, it's such an original project with really new uh, material and forms of analysis. I just, I learned so much. So I, I wanted to get, I wanted to say that straight away. I absolutely loved it. Oh my goodness. Thank you. That is so kind and generous. Um, the kind of um, thing you don't get to hear very often. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I do think that we tend to talk about books as, uh, you know, how do they change my understanding of this or that concept rather than learning. But um, for me, you know, as a, as a book writer as well, I, I always want to think maybe my book could teach, right? People could learn from it. And this is a book I think every reader is going to learn so much uh, from it because it is just has so much uniqueness to it that we'll get into. But before we get into some of the specifics about it, I wanted to ask you, and this is a sort of an invitation to both a personal and intellectual uh, uh, reflection, however you want to pursue it, just what drew you to the project, right? And I ask this because I think it's always interesting to get the story behind the origins of a book, such that people, uh, insofar as people want to share it, but also because, as you know, like writing a book is an investment of like your total time and often sense of self-worth <laughs> and sure. uh, all of your resources and health, everything goes into it. So something drew you to a really complex project that is this book. And I would love to hear a little bit about how it came to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that's a really great question. And it has me thinking about like the very beginnings of my of my journey as a scholar. You know, I went to grad school at Berkeley in comparative ethnic studies. And I went there with the idea that I was gonna specifically do a project on Puerto Rican um, literature. Like I was like, I'm gonna do this this work. You know, I came from an undergrad at Rutgers where I studied like English, Puerto Rican and Hispanic Caribbean studies and women and gender studies. And I thought that I would bring those together in the PhD. Um, and uh, when I was in grad school, I started to take lots of different seminars. Um, and there were two seminars in particular that really kind of shifted my thinking. One was Theorizing the Human, um, which was taught by Nelson Maldonado Torres. And one was um, a class in um, Africana Studies, um, in the Black Diaspora Studies Department um, by Percy Hinson that was like African and Caribbean um, history. Um, and in those two courses, I put together um, just a whole different way of thinking about things. So in the Theorizing the Human course, we were reading um, Emmanuel Eze, a uh, philosopher's book, The On Reason, um, the kind mm -hmm. of the book that he wrote right before he passed away. Um, and in there, he had a chapter on um, the kind of philosophy of language um, in post-colonial African literature. Um, and in yeah. there, he was uh, talking about Steve Freeman and the kind of debates about what African literature does to battle a historicity, um, the ways of... Uh, of the, the kind of contentions between African writers of a particular moment about what is African literature. So he was like talking about the debates of Nguyen Wathiongo and Chinua Achebe and, and, and Senghor and Cecilia, all these other folks. 
Um, and then on the other, in the other seminar, I think it was taking them at the same time, we were reading Glissant and we were reading, you know, um, Mudin Bay and we were reading all these other folks. And part of engaging, um, I, we also, I think, read Pedagogies of Crossing in that class. And part of engaging that work really expanded for me the idea of a kind of um, African and diasporic Caribbean connection, um, mm -hmm. as well as. I was also introduced there to a kind of visiting scholar from South Africa who was this Puerto Rican girl <laughs> um, who was studying in South Africa and her name was Natasha Hillman. And when I started talking to her about this paper that I was writing for my Theorizing the Human seminar, she introduced me to the literature from Equatorial Guinea. And she was like, hey, there's this African literature that is written in Spanish. Um, and that could be something interesting because I was really kind of getting into the question of of language, of decolonization, and how folks can engage in decolonial politics and practices, um, even as, as they're speaking and engaging in colonial languages. And so I just wanna kind of tease that out in the present moment with these Caribbean works. And then I started to kind of bring in this, um, uh, this very little known African literature um, into the mix. And it really expanded my own horizons of like what I, what I was going to do in grad school, uh, but it also really pushed me um, intellectually into a completely different place. And I think that was really exciting um, at that moment. And I kind of took that project and then continued to build around it uh, across a series of themes um, that I kept seeing come up over the course of the next few years. And you're right, it just it does take so much time and commitment. <laughs> it, when I think back about how many years, <laughs> it, you know, when I first started to do this and finally when the book came out in 2020, um, it's like, astonishing to me um, that, that it was that long, you know? Yeah, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> I say it all the time. It's like the the page count and the weight of the book never just seems to capture <laughs> the amount of time <laughs> uh, and energy. But it's, I'm glad I asked the question. I mean, people always have such interesting uh, ways into books, and so much of it is just fascinating. How much of these projects can come from visiting scholar in a conversation or a seminar where, you know, that happened to coincide and cross with that. Um, that's just, you know, the chances of, you know, part of the chances of finding these connections in a sort of perusing a library, you know, are very small, but so are the chances of these occasional conversations. And so. Um, absolutely. Really absolutely. That, that, that part. Yeah, um, and I actually, I think I still have Natasha's copy of uh, Las Tinieblas de Tu Memoria Negra. So, Natasha, if you're listening, I owe you a copy of the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you know, that's a undergrad and grad student uh, tradition of, of borrowing books and uh, <laughs> them never leaving the shelf. <laughs> yeah. I may have a few of those myself from college. <laughs> so one of the things I really like about the book, and it's, it's in a really positive way, has been a thing that's kind of confounded me um, thinking, like reflecting on the book after reading it, is how to characterize it, right? Because you draw on so, not just diverse sources, right? Obviously, um, anytime you take diasporic exchange seriously, you, you multiply your sources uh, hugely. But I really mean that as much uh, in that, that diversity of sources and modes of thinking uh, in terms of the, the ways you get into the project. It's not just a literary theory project. It's not just a sort of cultural theory, Black Atlantic theory project. It also, you know, you deal with cartography, you deal with art, you deal with memory studies. And that flows, at, I think, really key points with, you know, the interpersonal. And so I wonder for you, so I, I've struggled, right, thinking back on it, like, how would I actually describe the, the orientation and, and sensibility of this book? Um, and I think that this is, is one of its one of its really profound contributions is to challenge us to think about how to characterize that sensibility. I have my own thoughts, but I uh, was curious just to hear how you think back on the book in terms of the range of sources and methods and framings. How do you how would you characterize the orientation and sensibility of it? Yeah. Uh, well, first, I would love to hear your thoughts. I'm, I'm definitely going to answer the question, but I would love to hear how how you think about it um, because it would probably be helpful for me um, to see how people are receiving it and understanding it within the kind of broader range of our like fields and disciplines. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, you know, coming out of a comparative ethnic studies program, um, it was very much um, 
I think as I started to write the book, even though I was doing lit, let me let me start again. So the ethnic studies program that I was in is the social science program, right? Mm-hmm. So um, it was really interesting that I had gone there to study literature um, to a program that was much more social scientific than it was literary, although they did have some, you know, a handful of literary scholars and poets there. Um, and so in that way, it was very transdisciplinary in terms of the training um, and the approach and the way that I was kind of trained to take up a question, right? So you take up a, a particular kind of question and then you try to answer the question by engaging, you know, philosophy, literature, history, you know, um, in a series of different ways. Like, right, how, what are the different kinds of approaches to uh, answering that question or to analyzing a particular kind of problem? Um, and so I knew very early on when I started to write this uh, project, even as a graduate student in my dissertation, that me saying like, I'm going to do a literary studies or uh, kind of just only close reading or whatever was never going to be enough to satisfy my committee that was like, you know, Chin Min Ha, a filmmaker and feminist theorist, and, you know, Nelson Maltor is a, you know, religious uh, ph- and post-continental philosopher, and, you know, Keith mm-hmm. Feldman, who does work on, you know, um, on Black studies and Palestine, and, you know, and Ramon Grossogel, who does, you know, sociological work and, you know, in decolonial theory, right? Like, so I knew that I had to be able to show them that I could engage a series of different thoughts. And actually, even my qualifying exams came in handy years later. During the time, I was like, what is going on? But afterwards, I was like, this is super helpful um, because as I started to bring in um, visual culture into the book manuscript um, and music, those are those are one of the areas that I studied that I didn't really bring into the dissertation, but came in handy years later. And so for me, it is a kind of, um, it is an ethnic studies text, um, really like in a kind of straight up way to think about like this uh, very <laughs> um, uh, established field like you know at Berkeley in the way that they're thinking about Mm -hmm. comparativity in a way that I I kind of um depart in in thinking about comparativity to relationality but also the the kind of methodological approach which is like what are the multiple ways that we can answer this question and how are we understanding that approaching it from one singular discipline doesn't actually get at the problem right um and so then for me that was kind of the way to to think about the book and actually when I was writing the introduction I was trying to figure out like this is a, a text that relies so much on literature. It has these other elements as well. These other cultural, musical, visual elements. But how do I articulate that, um, especially to a reader who might be picking it up, who might be in literary studies? And they're like, where's the close reading that I want to see? Where's the like, you know, formal yeah. analysis, right? Um, so I had to be really clear. This is an ethnic studies project that is very literary at its base, um, but that it is, is not attending to the traditional disciplines in the way that we understands, but actually is actually attending to the work itself um, and how it illuminates a bunch of different aspects um, of what we think we know. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's interesting. I mean, I the, you know, multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary, whichever people prefer, is something that you know, people will evoke and even sort of attach to a work. I think it's hard to find works that really are multidisciplinary and coherent at the same time. I mm-hmm. think a lot of people will pause and say, well, now I'm going to do some literary analysis. Now I'm going to back up and tell an historical story. And that push and pull across disciplines is the way you bring multiple disciplines into a book. But those are just sort of stations in a text. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I think you, you do so well, and it's, I think it's really rare. It's certainly rare for, um, you know, uh, first book, I mean, it's, or any book, but um, what you do so well is really make the inter part of interdisciplinary work because the, the, the levels of thought and analysis that are happening when you're talking about literature or uh, recapitulating, you know, some historical moment and drawing out its significance, uh, evoking or talking directly about music, musicality, lyrics, and so forth. The, the, each step is full of the same kind of thought. And that's, you know, that's for me was a puzzle. It's like, well, what is this? Is it just enough to say it's interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary? I like that, you know, a, you know, an ethnic studies text at its core and the way it, that forces us to think about the relationship between disciplines. And I will also say, you know, I, for what it's worth, 
you know, one of the, it's a trendy, has been for a while, a sort of trendy way of phrasing things to talk about mapping this, mapping that. And nine times out of 10, I'm just like, what you call, what people are calling mapping is just like outlining or sketching, right? Okay. Like, is that really mapping? But one of the things I think is really like amazing about this book is that maybe for the first time, I was like, this idea of mapping that you work with, you know, or as a, as a way of ca- even just characterizing the sensibility of the book, well, maybe this is like the term we need because it's so infused with memory, with time, with identity, language, expressive culture, but never from roots, right? Always from this sort of relations of displacement and replacement and so forth. So, you know, that that idea of mapping, I, I think maybe for the first time, I felt like this was really the way we ought to be talking about, about work that we typically call uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, precisely because you do it, not because you use the term. Yeah. I mean, I'm like definitely picking up on the writers themselves. And that was like a big, that was such an important part of the book for me was to like take up the kind of literary and um, creative um, and nonfiction texts. Um, and the music and take them seriously enough to say like, these are going to be on par with some of the kind of theoretical frameworks, right. And actually can even illuminate or push some of our our frameworks in different ways. And so when I'm reading like in the first chapter, Juan Tomas Avila Laurel, um, Al del Monte de Noche, the mountain burns by night. And he keeps repeating, we are an Atlantic ocean Island. We're black people on this Island. Right. I keep thinking about how he's trying to mark a place, um, of a in, a in a series of overlapping histories in that place and connecting it to the larger Black Atlantic, right? Um, and 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 reaching out even from this, you know, quote insular territory that is the farthest away from its nation state, right? Um, and how even as he's like making like calling out across the ocean and saying like we're here, we're Black people on this on my Atlantic Ocean island, um, oftentimes we don't engage the work. We don't We don't see their work. We don't really get to engage their literature, their cultural productions in a way um, where they feel seen or witnessed, right? Um, by other folks on other Black Atlantic islands, you know? Um, so that is also part of like the draw to think about like, how do we remap ourselves um, in relationship um, to these other kind of oftentimes peripheralized places? And I like that. That is a great example. And I think it's, again, like one of the real virtues of the book where it's not you overlaying this idea. It's you picking up on something and saying, this is not a rhetorical flourish. This is a way of thinking. Now let's take it seriously as thinking. I mean, that's just so well done in the book and even what you just said. Um, You know, there's such a a way that especially literary uh, works or political works, a sort of political, literary, expressive uh, uh, life archive can get, you know, what gets put in rhetorical flourish and what gets put as thoughtful, like full of thought Mm -hmm. is such an interesting distinction. People, I think, often really cleave that uh, way too much. And, you know, your example there, and I think it's all across the book, is you find that thoughtfulness in every stop and that's not you know as as you put it you know it's 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 you taking the writers or the artists seriously instead of like well here's somebody who just said something i'm going to be the one who makes it thoughtful it's like taking taking the dignity and integrity of that utterance that that written bit and pursuing its thought it's it's really a, a wonderful part of the book yeah, and I think that that is like such an important part of the kind of reorientation um, that ethnic studies offered me um, in terms of thinking of um, cult, like of academic critique and and our own like scholarly writing, um, how mm-hmm. to decenter yourself um, and to think with others instead of about others um, were really early important lessons. Um, but also when you begin to think about the writings of Black and Indigenous people and colonial subjects, current or former, you begin to see the insurgency um, and the importance of what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Um, And then if you're able to take yourself out of the equation in many ways, um, you you can read and think about those works differently and they can like just shift, right? Um, Your entire worldview 
um, if you stop taking kind of um, the more formal or Eurocentric approach to thinking about like, what is my, you know, my position as the critic is the most important and I'm on top, right? And I'm <laughs> going to dictate whether yeah. this is a good novel or a bad novel, or if it's, you know, did they follow a particular kind of rule, right? Like, um, and for me, all of those kinds of questions fell away. Um, mm-hmm. And then the text themselves um, came forward. And I think that there is something important, particularly with the literature of Equatorial Guinea, because it gets produced in such harsh conditions. Um, and oftentimes you can see the urgency in the writing and the publication of work. And for some people who might be like formal literary scholars, they're like, well, this is seems unfinished and this, you know, seems a little rushed, right? But they're like writing against the dictatorship and against a particular kind of clock. And I think that begs for a different kind of reader, you know? Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. I like that. That's a really interesting way of articulating uh, scholarly responsibility, right? Responsibility to the conditions of production. You know, it's, a, it's an element of mapping, right? You map the, the production of the literary work into politics and memory and struggle and material conditions. Yeah. So let me ask you about um, the your choice to make this scholarly focus on, on Equatorial Guinea and the Spanophone Caribbean. Um, what's What for you was so important about that relationship? Right. On the one hand, you know, making it a, a, a scholarly focus, you pick up on something that doesn't exist in the literature. And so it, it, it marks us as a as a unique project or something without a lot of precedent. Um, but it, of course, the book is much deeper than that in terms of what this relationship means. Um, so I'm curious about the scholarly focus in um, uh, you know, in terms of what it says about that relationship. And what moved you to it, but also um, this is sort of follow up that I'll just say now. Um, you know, how does that focus on a very specific kind of relationship open up the book to wider issues in Black Atlantic studies? I guess particularly uh, Caribbean studies, and then for uh, also in this this you know this is um, stepping into a, a completely different field, but speculate a little bit about for African studies. I mean, when you do these the diasporic work that takes both sides seriously, so to speak, uh, both sides, um, it impacts how we think about Africa, African studies, African cultural production. So the first, it, what is it about this relationship that was so serious? And what about the scope of these claims? What sort of issues does it open up across the Atlantic world? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great, uh, those, those are really great questions. Um, and I'm thinking about the moment that I started to read the literature from Equatorial Guinea and seeing the resonances of it um, in the context of African literature that I had read in English, right? So I was like, oh, this is like, this is the formula, right? For this kind of like anti-colonial um, uh, reflection, right? Um, on the one hand, and then I started to then also see some interesting turns of phrase and connections to the Caribbean, particularly Caribbean Spanish um, in there. And then I started to dig into um, so the kind of first iteration of this project was thinking about languages, right? Um, and so I started to kind of jump into linguistics and so, um, and the kind of studies around the, the variations of Spanish in Equatorial Guinea and its, um, and its connections to the Caribbean and the long histories of like, you know, em, uh, Cuban emancipados, emancipated Cuban slaves being deported to, um, to Fernando Po, which is now Bioko, um, where the central city Malabo is, is located. Um, and then when I went to Malabo, I see this plaque commemorating those enslaved, like um, uh, Cubans who had been deported. Like they're like, you're free. Now you have to leave, right? You have to go to this other place. Um, and so then, you know, I saw that connection. I saw the kind of um, linguistic borrowings, right? The dialectical leveling that was happening. Um, and then I started to chase that a little bit longer and look at the kind of uh, history of anti-colonial agitators from the Philippines from Cuba, from Puerto Rico, who were then deported by, by the Spanish to Equatorial Guinea, also in a penal colony. Um, and then I was looking at like the history of these like poets from Equatorial Guinea um, creating these like um, odes and poetry dedicated to Black Caribbean, like Afro-Cuban poets and, and their reading, right? Like they're engaging this. Yeah. Um, and so there was this long history of connection. And not only that, and you start to dig into the history, and you're like, oh, you know, this becomes a, a, a Spanish colony 
um, early on, it's it's also doesn't really get consolidated into what is now Equatorial Guinea until right after the Spanish American War, where you know Spain loses its final colonies in the Pacific and the Atlantic, and then it renews its attention to Equatorial Guinea. And it's like, okay, now we're really going to do this. They they sign a Treaty of Paris. They're able to take over you know, some of the places that are being run by Portugal, right? And like they consolidate their territory to create Equatorial Guinea. And they're not uh, de- administratively decolonized until 1968, right? So you get all of this sense. That, and I was really floored that with all of these connections to the Caribbean, as someone who had studied the Caribbean, as someone who was from the Caribbean, I'd never even heard of this place, right? Yeah. I'd never even heard of this place. Um, I had no idea that this literature existed. Um, and for me, it was so important to like lay bare that history and that relationship, because I think we're dealing with a, a series of different things. And I think it was like both mutually beneficial <laughs> to kind of discuss this, um, as well as it prodded at certain questions. So one was the question I of see. like anti-Blackness um, and, and anti-Africanness that isn't just like folkloric in the Caribbean, right? Particularly in Latino studies. Um, dealing with the fact that we have this long connection to Guinea Equatorial um, and and this work. And there's also like a, a, a fleet of Cuban doctors and professors in, in Equatorial Guinea, like to this day, right? Like there's so much connection. Um, and yet that's something that we don't actually engage our actual connection to Africa, right? In a way that isn't essentialist oftentimes, right? Um, and then on the other hand, I also wanted to... Um, in many ways, like it's talked to the fact that like, and really, I, I don't want to sound like kind of condescending. I don't know. I don't know how the way to say, it, but my feeling was like, yo, my folks in Equatorial Guinea, you know, you're not, you're not writing into the void. Like we see yeah. it, we hear it. Like there's so much connection with other folks on the other side of the Atlantic, um, probably with folks on your side of the Atlantic, right? Like, and in diaspora, like these experiences that you're having there, there's so much relation and connection and resonances even as there's so many differences and for me that was so important in terms of like bringing this together because I think not only is it like trying to do away with the kind of fractures um the quote-unquote fractures that colonialism um attempts to to put upon us linguistic fractures right like geographical etc but it also um offers a different kind of like method for other places so one of the first questions I got when the book came out was like oh could you see this like in another another uh a context and i was like yeah like it's right next to anabon which was a former portuguese colony which now belongs to equatorial guinea is santo main principe and i'd be really interested like i don't know anything about their cultural production and what would that mm-hmm. look like in relationship to brazil right what would that look like in relationship yeah. to capo verde like so for me those kinds of like this is a, a different way of talking to one another where like the the empire is not at the center dictating yeah <laughs> the conversation. So, so that was for me, the kind of um, the importance of like trying to see, see that relationship and say like, there's something more here. Let's yeah. sit with it for a little while and see what comes up. Um, and that's a really then, great way, by the way, of explaining the title decolonizing diaspora. Right. Oh. It's just, it's, it's a, like, you, I mean, you just described the title really. It's, <laughs> it's, it's Thank really you. moving. It's moving yeah. exactly <laughs> away from the problem of decolonization being solely about the evacuation of empire and in some ways decolonizing after decolonization right yeah. it's like yeah it's like different kinds of relations sorry i, I interrupted no. you but no 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 that i mean that's absolutely right like you know the the big kind of like <laughs> the big headache i guess sometimes in some of the more formal studies on equatorial guinea whether it be from like a political scientist or like it's, I'm talking in Spain because it's it's hardly talked about in the U.S. but um, or historians is kind of like you know they were a colony yes and that is so sad uh, and uh, but then they got their freedom and then they got a dictator and like where this dictatorship the, the problem was the dictatorship you know and I'm like well they were under Franco's regime <laughs> under fascist rule right like for all of these years and so we're not thinking about like you're imagining that you like decolonize this place and all of a sudden they're inherently like violent and terrible and right. Like without thinking about the long legacy of like administrative decolonization is not actual decolonization in any way. Right. Um, and so it's, it's been interesting to have these conversations uh, and talking about the multidisciplinary, having a siloed conversations about 
Equatorial Guinea in different locations yeah. or about the Caribbean. And very hardly is there a place to talk about the project as a whole together, right? Um, in a kind of uh, intellectual environment. Um, but, but it's really interesting to see the way that people are conceiving of what happens in a particular kind of place and the responsibility, right? Of, yes. of empire in that, but I digress. <laughs> and that's and that's you know that's why I had the second question you know as someone myself who works in Black Atlantic studies with a particular focus on the Caribbean uh, you know anglophone and, and francophone um, I just wonder you know for you how you think this book I mean you've spoken a lot to it but just to, to re, maybe just reask the question uh, this way is you know how how should Caribbean studies Black Atlantic studies and maybe even African studies look different after your book. Yeah, no, for sure. That's such a good question. And I was thinking about this. Uh, I've been thinking about this for a long time, in particular, because, you know, this literature from Equatorial Guinea is, is has so many resonances to the Caribbean, but it is also an African literature, but it is not necessarily part of the African canon, because yeah. it's kind of alone in its productions in Spanish, right? So it's surrounded yeah. by, you know, it's Nigeria is right above it, it's next to Cameroon and Gabon. So it's like, Anglophone, Francophone, you know, Lucifone literature, right? So it's never really kind of taken in as part of like the literary and the cultural production of the African continent. And then because so much of the literature is produced in Spain um, under the threat of the dictatorship, right? Um, from afar, um, uh, it also has that kind of displacement, even though so much of the literature is speaking back to, right, to Guinea. Um, and yet it's also not considered part of like the Spanish canon, right? By yeah. virtue of it being done by <laughs> by Africans, even if they're former colonial subjects, right? So there's so much of this interesting way in which it comes, it falls out of this discourse that it like right, be right rightfully belongs in. Um, and um, so I think in African studies that kind of thinking about Equatorial Guinea um, as part of that kind of expanding how it understands um, it's literature, um, engaging these folks that are writing in a different language um, becomes so important um, in that context. Um, and then I think in the kind of Caribbean studies, I think um, <laughs> in Caribbean studies and Latino studies, it's like, let's actually um, expand our um, our frameworks, our, like, our chronologies of who we are and think about who else is in conversation with us, right? Like, we know that we are just a kind of meta archipelago, um, but that we actually, when we're thinking about the Black Atlantic, we need to think very broadly. Um, and even when we're thinking about archipelago studies, like there are these islands on the other side of the Atlantic um, yeah. that we can reach towards and, and engage with. Um, and I think in Black studies, it's been important, I think for me to kind of make a space and a claim for like Black uh, people who speak Spanish, right? Like, or Black yeah. Latinos, right? Because we are the majority of Black people, <laughs> like, right? Like, we are the major in, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, like, right outside of Africa, the largest population of Black people is in Brazil, and then Colombia, right? Um, the Caribbean, <laughs> and then the United States, right? So I think that the kind of, you know, um, I think part of it is like, um, that the U.S. Is, is, is a hegemony, right? Like, we, we often, what we say here, uh, what we do, our, our intellectual productions often overdetermine what happens and how, what people think about a particular kind of issue. Um, yeah. And so because we, we do our work in English, um, it can overdetermine like who is Black and what is this and what is that, right? Um, but I think that making a, 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 a space for, you know, Black uh, Latino folks, Latinx folks in Black studies is so critical for us to expand the ways that we think about Blackness. Um, and Latino studies also has to expand the way that it thinks about <laughs> Blackness, right? Um, and I think that there has to be um, a way to reach across these kinds of silos um, yeah. in ways that are not, um, like I said before, essentialist or folkloric, right? Or reaching to yeah. a particular kind of um, uh, picturesque past when we have a much re more recent past that is so important for us to, mm -hmm. to, to excavate. And in that way, you know, it has resonance for me uh, in what you were just saying, because I, 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 I'd love that response um, so much to think about, but it really resonates with, you know, what Gilroy tried to do in the black Atlantic in terms of saying, look, look, the scholarly production in the United States. So over determines 
just in terms of, of, of volume, but then overdetermines the frames by which we understand blackness and the Atlantic world. And I think your book in not broad terms, but in very specific terms, right, is able to get into the details of what that would mean, right, by changing that sense of relationship. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, again, that's what I really loved about the book. It's such a hard thing for us to do as writers is to have this very specific kind of focus, right? Because specific focus allows you to really give what you're writing about uh, at the attention to, to its content and its thoughtfulness that it, that it deserves, but then also balance it with this big vision. And, and you have, uh, you really pull that off so well in the book. And that's, that's why I felt comfortable asking, like, what do you think in terms of black Atlantic studies, Caribbean studies and African yeah. studies? And I, myself, I mean, I felt challenged in terms of, of how I think about the relationship of the, um, of the black Americas to, and specifically the Caribbean, to Africa, which is so determined by the sort of negritude, quasi-essentialism, um, or the sort of existential rejection of Africanness in somebody like Fanon, or the sort of Africa as fragments that you get, you know, in, in Glissant and Brathwaite and people like that. This is a very different approach, and I think it just opens up so many other scholarly possibilities for the rest of us. That's a real gift of the book, I have to say. Well, thank you. And, you know, like, you know, I was struggling a little bit with thinking about, like, the, the title of the book where I talk about with, like, Afro-Atlantic, right, versus Black Atlantic. And one yeah. of the reasons that I chose Afro-Atlantic um, is because when I'm thinking about um, the Spanish-speaking Black world, I think about the words like Afrodescendiente, you know, um, the folks in Guinea as, like, Africanos living in Spain or, you know, somos Africanos y Negros. And, um and all of those kinds of ways to think about um, one's blackness in the Spanish speaking world, I felt needed to be represented. And that I could say black, right? Black Atlantic. Um, but again, it, it also gives into the English version of blackness um, versus the very multiple ways of blackness that uh, the word Afro in the Spanish speaking world conjures up, right? Um, and even this has been a problem uh, in translation, it's been really interesting because the book is being translated right now into Spanish. Um, and, you know, the book opens up with this epigraph um, from Sylvia Winters, The Ceremony Must Be Found After Humanism, where she talks about the chaos roles, right? Like folks defining themselves against the chaos roles to which they've been defined. And she says like feminist from woman, Chicano from Mexican American, black from Negro. And, and, and so my translator and I <laughs> have been talking for months about like, in Spanish, like, wh where do we go from negro from negro? Like, and trying to think about, like, even the idea of, like, black and negro in English as these, like, limiting words that don't really, that are, in translation, reduced to the exact same word and yeah. doesn't actually get us to what we're saying. And so we're thinking about all of the other ways to kind of denote blackness in the Spanish-speaking world and then how that mm, can answer. But because the Spanish-speaking world is so... um broad right and and nation by nation those things differ we're trying to figure out what is the right way to even translate in english black to yeah. uh you know to a spanish like liberatory black right um yeah. and what that might might look like so th those are the kinds of things for me that came in and saying like i want to be in conversation with obviously i'm in conversation with gilroy and with other folks who are engaging the atlantic and black atlantic but how do i do so from the sensibility of someone who knows that across translation some of these things can get lost, you know? I, you know, and I have to say, I hope that, uh, that you write an essay about that <laughs> process. I mean, I really mean it in a, in a sort of, you know, first person narrative, but also, I mean, the, you, that unlocks so much. I mean, that's a really complicated question. We could spend a lot of hours working through that, you know, because that's, that goes to not just the problem of translation generally, but the, as you were pointing out, the stakes of this translation choice is really huge because you didn't say, you know, how do we translate the, you know, English sense of blackness into Spanish? It's like a liberatory sense. Yeah. That's that dimension that, that adds um, urgency and depth and, and a kind of desperation to get it right. You know, you don't want to, yeah. the, the stakes are very high. I, I really love that. So, if I can, like, you know, back up again to um, to to talk about the the book, 
um, as in its sort of wide contribution, I, I think that books have a couple of ways of being really important. One is what, what you've talked about, which is finding either a figure or a set of relations or a geography. And I think you do all three of those in, in the book that's, that other scholars haven't really tapped into or haven't tapped into adequately. But I think one of the ways that books also have, and for me, one of the more interesting ways that books have an enduring uh, effect and trans transformative uh, relationship to scholarship and the history of development of ideas is innovations in terminology, right? I mean, you've, you've already talked about it. I think that's part of why I was so drawn in by what you were saying about translation. I was like, this moment of translation you're talking about, that's like a, a conceptual problem. Right, that we're working through, um, but you know, concepts or ideas or frames, however one wants to put it, you know, new versions of those, right, innovative terms, I think, are also how books have an, a, a, have a really a deep impact. And I think one of the real innovations in, in the book and its contribution to to those of us who who write about the Caribbean or about the Black Atlantic with the diasporic sensibility is the formulation and then deployment of this of this term destiero right so i want to ask you to walk through that concept a little bit uh, both where it came from and what work you think it does in the book and i was particularly struck by this term in relationship to what you call or how you treat the problem of witnessing yeah no that's a great question bringing those two together yeah um, so I will say, going back to my comment about my qualifying exams that I took many, many, many years over a decade ago. Um, they're hard to point, forget, though, aren't they? <laughs> they're hard to forget. They're hard to forget. But I was reading, I did a list that was like Latinx literature, Latino, Latina literature from 1898 to the present, whatever it was, right? So that was on my list. And in that list, I read Achio Bejas's Days of Awe. And in that book, I was so struck, right? It was The book was so much about translation and about particular kinds of language. And it was about, um, it was very much about also about exile and hiding of one's uh, identity. Um, and there was a passage there that kind of hailed this term desierro, right? And, and hailed the difference between the term desierro and exile. And that is something that really stayed with me. And in my dissertation, it's footnoted. Like I'm, I wrote a chapter in my dissertation about exile and I really built on um, post-colonial studies and their understanding of exile because it's just, Postcolonial studies is so rich in thinking about diaspora and thinking about exile in a way that decolonial studies, it, it, it in contemporary decolonial thought is not, right? Um, I couldn't really I find agree. like where to draw on it. So I really leaned heavily on, on postcolonial thought and poetry and 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 essays and writing and Darwish and Said and you know, um Sehan and all these other folks. Um, but then I had a footnote that I said like when I rewrite this, like FYI committee, when I rewrite this, I'm going to really expand on this thing, this theater. Um, and, you know, when I was writing the book, I was thinking about um, how I could do the same thing. I could just lean on this post-colonial framework to do this. But I really was interested, you know, at, at the kind of center of the book, was interested in the ways that these literatures are pushing us uh, to think differently and are pushing decolonial theory forward. Right, rather than us always reading things with a particular theoretical lens, reading literature and other texts with this lens, like how does the literature push this forward? And so I really leaned into this question of the destierro, this idea that like destierro is a different thing than exile. It means to be forcefully torn away from the earth, right? To be displaced um, yeah. in this like physical and even existential way. Um, and at the same time, I was engaging in these conversations um, around reparations. I was at different conferences. Um, and listening to, right, um, the question of Black and Indigenous operations in the U.S. North American context, right? And as a Black Puerto Rican woman, I'm sitting there and listening to both very um, generative conversations as well as very contentious conversations around the question of belonging, right, in this territory, right, in this North American territory. Um, and also knowing that, like, it's, I'm also here, like as a colonial subject, <laughs> um, on these settled lands, right? Like, and so thinking about where, where, where do I step into this conversation in an ethical way, right? Yeah, um, knowing that my history is both different than 
both um, indigenous North American folks and African American folks whose history is here. My history is, you know, my family arrived here displaced in the 1970s, right? So my history of of enslavement and disenfranchisement and dispossession is, is a different one. It's a Caribbean one and it's a Spanish and overlapping American one. So I was thinking about this question of this theater. I was thinking about where do we, how do we understand ourselves in the context of diaspora and exile? Where do we bring those together? Um, and how do we bear witness to each other's histories? Um, and for me, this theater was a, is a, was a beautiful way to kind of begin that conversation in decolonial theory, in decolonial thought by l- using the literature as the basis to imagine um, what it would mean for us to understand our histories of dispossession in the kind of long today, right? Um, to think about the kind of colonial project and its desire to dispossess people of their lands, of their knowledge, of their languages, right? Of their spiritual practices. Um, and how then what we find is displaced people onto the lands of other displaced people, multiple generations of different forms of, of loss. But the destierro is not just loss, it is also a kind of reclaiming um, and an and aferrando and adhering to um, one's cultural practices of reclamation, right? A resurgence of those things. Um, and that the other part of it for me was that like destierro is not, um, it's not enough to just bear witness to your own forms of destierro and reclamation, but that for it to be, be truly decolonial, um, a, a decolonial poli- po- like political practice, you have to be able to bear witness to someone else's, right? To be able to sit yeah. in a room and say, you know, in a room where someone is saying like, well, if we're thinking about black and indigenous operations in, in North America, well, the black people, you can have the mule, but the 40 acres are ours as indigenous people. And, you know, and then as someone who's black Puerto Rican, who has like, not a, not a, not a dog in that fight, right? Like not, not, right. Like has to actually sit and say like, how do I bear witness to this and how, like, what is the place of for us to bear witness to one another in this kind of long fucked up process, right? Um, and yeah. for me, this theater is like really trying to get at um, how do we engage the question of exile, of diaspora, of dispossession, of genocide um, in a different way, in a way that is um, mutually um, loving um, and mutually caring, um, even though it can be tense and, and it can be frustrating and painful. Um, so for me, thinking about that and then looking at the literature and looking at the different exam- the multiple examples of the ways that people get torn away from memory, from lands, right, from a sense of self, from language, that became really important because you can multiply the ways that you can think about what does it mean to be in diaspora, what does it mean to be in exile, and from what, right? And then how do you find your way back either physically, emotionally, or not at all, right, um, and, and, and contend with that reality? So that's how I kind of formulated the concept and how I how I walked and and like built through it through the works themselves and the way you were talking about it it adds as you say this this it it because it's it evokes the term evokes land right earth and forcibly being torn which is about time which is about memory it really gets back to my sort of initial uh, uh, you know, self-observation, really, but that this idea of mapping really makes so much more sense to me after, as a critical uh, characterization, a critical concept or characterization after your book, precisely because of the way I think you describe this term as connecting to the material geography of loss and displacement, right? So literally the map matters, right, as earth, but it also matters as time and memory and language. Yeah. And, and you know, you really. The, no, I, don't know, I was gonna say it was this kind of moment where, even though the the book is about Equatorial Guinea, and the Spanish speaking Caribbean, it it op- like I had to also take in take seriously the place that I'm writing the book from, and that also informed how I'm how I was writing. You know, so like it it, it moves to this like, you know, it's this Caribbean and African thing. But then also some things are popping off here in the ways that we think about um, land and belonging and self in North America. Yeah. And then those the, that chapter and the next chapter all like kind of move in that direction. And there's also thinking about like the diaspora, like Caribbean folks in the diaspora and how they're attending to or not attending to the question of black and indigenous relations on the land that we're on. And I, you know, the, I love the term. I think it, it, needs to stick in our critical vocabulary because I think it it gathers so much to it in unique ways. 
But one of the things that really strikes me about it is, and you've spoken to it, how difficult it makes it for us to talk about place and home and relation and roots and all of that. I mean, it's an unsettling term, but it's unsettling insofar as it has a deep ethical claim on us that you've really articulated. You articulate it well in the book, obviously, but really just in what you were just saying, I think really articulates that so well because that how do you you know so much of you know caribbean african-american thought in particular is about claiming these spaces as home Mm -hmm. but this uh space that you're opening up with this term makes that a much more complicated language but it's complicated by its ethical and material claim on us i i really love that and i think one of you sort of alluded to it or or or, you know brought up uh, mentioned the word you know one of the ways to think about how to speak in that space between multiple kinds of exile multiple kinds of of being torn from land uh one of the ways i think you try to get us to think about it and so i want to hear you talk a little bit about it is with this word this term love right which is a fascinating term to see pop up um, because obviously it's a critical concept. And so you fashion it uh, in really important ways and, and really rigorously. So I want to know, you know, why love in this context, but especially it's not just love, it's decolonial love. And what does that modifier of decolonial help us see about love as not just an affect, but a critical concept in the very space, the the very painful and complicated space that you open up uh, around this no- these notions of displacement and exile. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, I really, um, I, I know that oftentimes when we think about the question of love, it can become like superfluous. You know, like I feel like most academics are like allergic in many ways to to thinking through love, and that's not that's not a wholesale thing. Cause I know obviously I'm leaning on so many thinkers who are thinking about love, but um, I think sometimes it's odd to see it. Right. Uh, but for me, decolonial love was, um, was such an important part of the book. And I often say that like it's decolonial love that, that made me stick with this project. And that this is the reason why I kept pushing forward and doing this. Um, and for me, it's, it's not superfluous at all, but it's actually um, based in, in uh, reciprocity um, and interrelationality, um, in a way of seeing yourself and defining, um, yourself against the kinds of pathologies, um, and, and fracturing that, you know, the colonial machinations have offered, but not only that, but seeing someone else, the other, right. Um, the other, um, that is under that same kind of yugo of, of these kind of colonial machinations and seeing them, um, as not fractured, as not pathological, as not right, like broken, um, but instead offering um, a sense of care and generosity that will listen to the stories, that will engage the knowledge and the worldviews in ways that are not skeptical, right? Yeah. Um, in ways that that um, honor their humanity um, and honor what they offer um, to ourselves in the world and. For me, like thinking about decolonial love, it's not just like kind of this like theory on the page, but it's also like an action, right? What are the ways that we um, can engage um, with one another um, without having um, a sense of debt or something owed, right? Um, yeah. How is it that we can support one another um, in our work, in our lives, beyond the kinds of limits um, that we are oftentimes um offered in a very kind of individualistic society, right? Sure. Um, and so for me in the book, um, I continue to build on the definition of decolonial love. It comes up often um, and it gets to the very end where I talk about it as attention to, you know, to 1492 and the past before it and the dead beneath the sea and and those of us who are living, right? Um, it is a way to, to look into the kind of vast and inconsolable sea, which is a quote, right? Um, and to think about love as what Chela Sandoval calls a technology for social transformation. Um, yes. And for me, decolonial love um, is in the kind of living of the survival of languages, right? Um, of our <laughs> uh, African languages, indigenous languages, our, of our Afro-Indigenous colonial languages, right? Um, it is in the survival of particular kinds of 
syncretic practices, right? Um, and then the desire um, to um, to continually reclaim what has been taken away from us and to be able to bear witness to that is so important because I think oftentimes we can have this impetus, but without acknowledging that that love is 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 pushing towards a future that is not a colonized future towards a present that is not a colonized present, oftentimes that could be like such an erasure of, of so much effort. So to acknowledge it as a decolonial love um, becomes for me so important and why um, and why I am like continually building on that concept in the book. And there's so many other folks who've written about decolonial love or written about love, right? Um, and so for me, that is the, the kind of articulation of decolonial love um, becomes so important. And I feel it undergirds not just the book um, and and like the the arc of the argument, but also the practice. And I have to remember, like you know, when you when you get those times as a scholar, where you're like so frustrated. You're like, why am I still messing around with the same project? Right? Like, what yeah. who, who who do I owe this to? You know, like why am I doing this? And I keep thinking about like the the writers from Equatorial Guinea and interviewing them, and they're just you know they when I talk to them about like who's your audience and what, and they just we just want our stories to be heard. We just want someone to read, to re- to know, you know, what's going on. Um, and to think about um, the Spanish-speaking Caribbean and the way that Black people, their lives are obscured oftentimes, right, by the the kind of even denial of their existence um, and how much of, of the work itself is fueled by saying, like, okay, this project is not for me. <laughs> this is a project that I owe, right? Um, and I don't owe, like, a debt, but it is a, a particular kind of love um, and it's a decolonial love. And so for me, that's how I think about it as both a methodology and an attitude, you know? That's brilliant. That's, that's fantastic. And I, I love the, the, I mean, the rehabilitation and really rigorous, both conceptualization of, of love and decolonial love, and also the, the, the consistent deployment of it, you know, the way you described, you know, what it means to go read in, in the, and interpret and represent in this mode of decolonial love where it becomes, you know, method, concept, affect, all of these things. Um, I, I, it's one thing to articulate it. It's another thing to practice it. And, and that the practicing of it in the book is interesting because it becomes its own kind of demonstration of the concept it's in a really brilliant way. So another thing, and you also mentioned this, um, and, and I'm curious actually if it, it would, relationship you might see it having to to love and decolonial love one of the real surprises for me in the book you know when i first picked it up and started reading it was the turn to the question of reparations you know just sort of <laughs> looking at the cover i you know i don't know how you look at books but i look at the cover then i look at the uh, bibliography to just get a sense of you know what kind of citations the book has and then everybody scans the acknowledgments when it's a friend because you're like oh yeah. I'm in, am i in there i am in there i was really excited yeah. um, <laughs> and then i just read and the appearance of reparations was a surprise for me i mean that in a really positive way i was like oh i did not see that coming yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned material reparations, you know, that's, that's, that's a part and you acknowledge that and have some words to say, but the, your twist on it, like love is decolonial reparations. So I'm curious what, to hear you talk about how your treat, you think your treatment of, of repair as decolonial reparation contributes to thinking about reparations more broadly and just why, you know, why this made an appearance. You, you talked about, you know, your own sort of, scholarly community and travels and talks i imagine that's part of it but in terms of the book uh how do how do you see it fitting in and then w- uh, the wider question of reparations which sort of out of nowhere seemed to 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 become a political issue on the national scale in the united states and of course in caracom for for some time now so in terms of contributing to thinking about reparations more broadly what is decolonial reparations and how does it function in the book yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And, you know, it started um, really interestingly. I'm someone who takes like um, calls for papers at face value. So a few years, I think 2010, there was a, a ASA, com- ASA conference, American Studies Association. The theme was reparations. And I had been, uh, I had just finished taking exams and I was starting to write the dissertation. And I was like, you know, there's a few of these books that, that really kind of fall into that, right? So I kind of wrote a paper for this conference and was about reparations. And then I explained that I got good, really good feedback from Juan Flores and may he rest in peace and some other folks. Um, and then it, it stayed in the dissertation, right? But in a way that 
is very different than the way that I'm developing it in the book. The book, the chapters kind of build on each other, right? So it starts with like intimacy, like, and like, this is all the things that these books can can do if we, if we read them and all the concepts they offer us, but who is seeing it, that's witnessing. And then it's like, and if we are witnessing it, that's a precondition for decolonial politics and projects. Um, then what is the first thing we should be able to bear witness to when it's destierro? And it's like, okay, destierro is the condition that like black and indigenous and other colonized folks um, have been under. What, like, what does the reparation look like, right, for this condition? Besides our own working fastidiously against ongoing forms of oppression, right? Um, and so here's where reparations comes in, and it comes in into that kind of argument in this kind of organic way um, in the book that is not the same in in the kind of previous project, but. I was thinking about reparations and I was thinking about um, at the time that I was rewriting this, it was like 2014, we're writing this chapter and it was the CARICOM law student. And it was made, it was a huge deal. And, you know, I was like frustrated because not all of the Caribbean nations are part of CARICOM because of the still, you know, the foot and the hand fingers of empire are still in there. Right. Yes, um, absolutely. And yeah. And how important um, this, this was, but also like what happens when, <laughs> right. Like, and I, 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 uh, this is where again ethnic studies comes in because then you know read have read as a grad student about reparations in the kind of Asian American context in the Canadian you know indigenous like First Nations indigenous context right so I'm like okay so I have all this sense of reparations I'm reading Robin Robin Kelly's kind of like overview and treatment of reparations in African American context and I'm like okay that like you know material reparations are important yes but what happens when we allow the state to decide um, and come to a figure, a number, kind of like a positivist equation. And they're like, okay, great. We're giving you, you know, we gave, you know, folks who were interned in the, in the Japanese internment camps, 20 grand. We're not giving you, you know, any of your property or, <laughs> or any of your things back. Right. Um, good luck. And let, let's never talk about it again. Right. And we might just, you know, and reparations might come about for, for African-Americans one day. And they're like, we'll give you eight grand. Let's never talk about <laughs> enslavement, the prison system, the education. We're never going to, right? And so I was thinking about the fact that we've inherited a very kind of corrupt and very new, <laughs> very recent understanding of repair and reparations in the context of our nation. Um, and that then we go along with that equation um, and say like, okay, let's try to calculate what is owed for these, for these harms that have been committed. And while I think that that is important, I also think it's important to think about reparations on the other side, which is, again, going back to that question and those kinds of conversations that I was a part of between Black and Indigenous uh, reparations, I was like, okay, so if we come up with a, a, a number or a, a acreage of land, like this actually doesn't really get to the harms um, that were done. And it actually does not heal or repair the relationship between people who believe they're owed something different, either from yeah. one another, right? Um, or from the state. And so for me, I was thinking about like, how do we prepare for um, a material reparation, right? How do we prepare for that? Um, how do we engage in what I call in the chapter of reparation of the imagination to imagine our relationships differently with other folks, to imagine, you know, um, a reparations. I think, and there's a series of different books that I analyze in that chapter. And one of them is like really trying to like do a, like a building by building black by black reparation of like Spanish Harlem, right? And it kind of fails. and at the end, it's kind of like, oh, actually the re repair is a repairing of how I see my community, a repairing of like the, of the kind of pathological idea I had about the, the, the like Spanish that we speak or the language, the Spanglish that we speak and, and the place that we live. And also my idea of like my individual needs versus opening my home to another, right? Opening, opening the research that I have to another versus another text. Um, that thinks about reparations in the kind of equito Ghanaian imaginary as one that is based on blood, based on on bloodshed and the bringing forth of future generations as a repair, as a bomb to the nation itself, right? So there's multiple ways to approach the question of reparation. And I think what I wanted to show is that like our conversation about reparations that we're having right now are so limited, right? Um, they're limited to the kind of equation of money. And that is, I think, something that is like in the better interest of the of the kind of in, empire and the nation state um, and it's not you know doesn't necessarily think about uh, reparations in a holistic way or in a way that is decolonial um, in a way that will allow us to imagine together what that might look like to repair relationships um, in a way that would then allow for us to have a different kind of 
um, approach when those material reparations do come through, right? When we finally wear these folks down, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. That's uh, that's a way of, for me, of taking a term like decolonial decolonization, which is both widely uh, used, no, not with that widely, but widely enough used. But I think, you know, the sort of peanut gallery, pot shot, whatever critique of it is always, well, you know, it doesn't have any material impact. And what mm-hmm. I like uh, about the, the the book and then the, the way you, you cast it just now is it's very much connected to to all of these things about mapping, right? It's that if you map the question of reparations onto the experience and the geography of all these dislocations, it is this wider and deeper existential event. And that, that decolonial is a way of thinking about that, right? Of, of getting the hand of empire out of the entire, not, not not out of a part of the question, but out of the center of the question and thinking about all of these matters of relation. Right. So, you know, as readers of the book, you know, readers will make of a, of a book what they will. That's for me always part of the terror of publishing something. Someone can read a book and, and who knows where it goes uh, in the reader's mind. Um, but at the same time, I, I think books really form us as readers. And I think your book, part of it's the effect of this multidisciplinary approach is that it that it's it's it, it's overwhelming in the best sense, right? We have to really gather what we read into our own thinking as readers and you know, sit with it. And so I'm curious for you as an as uh, the author of the book how you imagine or envision the walk away from the book. And I say walk away from the book rather than take away, because take away is like you have a little snippet and you use it and it's like an instrument. But part of the book and you know what you were just saying about reparations is, is trying to get at something more than a snippet or a phrase or a quick categorization. And it said like walk away, like how do we walk and think differently after the book? What do you, what do you want us as readers to have as that walk away? Yeah. Um, I, this question is so uh, hard because I think um, for, as like, as a writer, as a writer and thinking of this as my first book, as like a first generation, like scholar, right? First generation high school graduate and college graduate, all that stuff that I am. It's always like a shock to me that someone would read my book, you know, um, anytime. Right. And so like, number one, like you read the book, holy crap. Number two, there's something that you can take from it that you will use. Oh my, like out of, out of this world, out of this planet, you know? So, um, so that's really, um, that's like my first step, you know? Um, and I think that, um, it's just like an honor, right. On the, on that one hand. And then when I think about what I would like folks to take away from the book, besides like, you know, concepts or words or phrases, I think, um, the larger thing for me is like, I would say like, I, I, I hope that maybe they'll engage some of the work um, that I that I um, am citing on building on, like these writers, these authors, and make sure that they get their shine and, and, and their place. But that in a larger sense, I hope that it can like reframe um, some of the ways that we think about um, literature and art and maybe make us curious about um, places and people and writing um, and experiences um, and even thought uh, from different places, right? And like, and start to um, build up um, uh, a kind of interest, right? In these other more peripheralized, more obscured um, uh, works. Um, And then I think, um, you see, this is a really hard question for me to answer. And then I also think that maybe um, another dope thing that could happen is if folks start to think about um, decolonization and decolonial politics in different ways, um, not just in the kind of, you know, as you were talking about before, the kind of um, uh, armchair critiques that, or the kind of dismissal or whatever, but as like, these are actions and, um, and practices that are, exist um, and that they, they don't have to be some grand form 
um, but that there's folks always, always resisting, always building in the cracks um, of the of colonial projects, um, and that this is this book is just a bunch of examples of how that happens, you know, yeah. um, and that maybe they'd be interested in looking and and learning about how other folks are doing it in other places. So just I think maybe a direction towards like externally to like rethink maybe some like well-worn ideas you might already have or assumptions you might have already yeah. made. Um, maybe that could be like really nice, but, um, but that's, that's all I have. Like, I have like, really <laughs> like, no, <laughs> you like, being no, I know it's a kind of a weird nothing. question, yeah. but uh... no, it's a good one, but it's just like, Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> you read it. Thanks. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, have to, I have to say, I mean, this is just me talking about me but i you know i'm a reader and i I think readers share a lot of things but you know especially around both uh, the question of reparations and decolonial love decolonial reparations and decolonial love i have to say that it made me think differently about uh this book project i'm working on on james baldwin because the idea of repair and love is absolutely at the center of what he does. And I felt mm-hmm. comfortable with my way of talking about it and, and uh, characterizing his thought. And I read the book and I was like, you know, it, it's made the language in the project a lot sharper, but it's also made the project a lot more uh, complicated in, in ways mm-hmm. that are frustrating in terms of the expediency and getting it to the press and all that, yeah, <laughs> but in yeah. the best way, right? I mean, that's, you know, for me after it's, this is one of these books that after reading it, I, I walked differently as a, as a scholar and had to not upend things I was talking about, although maybe at times, but yeah. certainly uh, use more careful language. And that's part of what I loved about the book is the way I, I couldn't talk in my current project the same way. Even though James Baldwin and, and it, you know, is in some ways is very far from what you're talking about in the book. But it is also about this, you yeah. know, Atlantic world and love and repair and fracture and pain and land and all of that. And so... You know, that's just to say, you know, if if, if what you said you wanted, uh, that at least worked for me and I know for yeah. other people as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, it's there, right? There's a relationship, even though it seems distant, but there is a question of like belonging, right? And identity um, yeah. and, and place, right? Involvement that is also um, in this work. And, you know, I have to say your book on Glissant came out when I was doing my final revisions of it. And I knew that I had to say something more about this time. So I was like, like reading, like reading your book and being like, this is, you know, and, and being able to even like cite that book in my book was so important. Um, because I think the treatment that you give to, uh, Glissant's, uh, work is so, um, it is so rich, um, and, and generous. And it made me realize one of the things that I've been struggling with in, in, in writing this book, which is like, you don't have to say everything about everyone, right? Like I was thinking like, John wrote this book on Glissant so you can relax because it's been said, right? Like <laughs> and you can point to this other book and someone will, all the things that you missed about Glissant in this book, they'll read this other book and everybody's going to be fine, you know? Like, <laughs> and so That's for me, nice that was like, say, I appreciate it that. was such a relief, you know? I was like, okay, you know? Um, <laughs> because I think part of this is like, it you know, writing a book and even being an academic, it sex you up to think that you have to be the expert of everything and everyone that you yeah. mentioned or that you read. And that if you don't do that, then you don't deserve to even utter the name or sit claim that you might know something, right? Um, and it's kind of like, we, we all can't build up a mini book in our footnotes, right? Yeah. Um, less I, I had a footnote that was like a three page footnote and my editor was like, you have to stop playing games. And I was like, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and so was it Trevor? Was, um, no, it was uh, Gianna at the time. But yeah, okay. but Trevor, sorry. Trevor came in after. Um, poor Trevor. <laughs> he had to do the nitty gritty with me, you know. Wow. Um, but uh, but yeah. So all that to say is like it really helped me kind of disabuse myself of the 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 the, the need the the idea that I needed to be like a master of all the theorists. Right. To be able to say this thing. And so to lean on the work of other people to say, like, if you want to know more about this, go here. Right. And go there. And and so that's, you know, that's part of it. So anyway, boy, that is a hard thing to do as a writer. 
So I mean, <laughs> just to, to give up that desire to oh, not yeah. ever make mistakes. And I mean, that's, you know, you know, I'm a sort of like broken record with this, with my students, but also as, as a, as a scholar colleague that, you know, saying something interesting is so much more important than saying something quote, right. Mm -hmm. But boy, is that a hard thing to make the leap from like, I'll let person A and B do the foundations and let me try to do something interesting with that. And I, I, again, I think that your book has that, you know, it's one, another way of characterizing what I think is so interesting about your book as, you know, close readings and attentiveness to detail, but also that attentiveness to detail is not to get it right or do a sort of philological exercise. It's to 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 propose something interesting and that when you propose something interesting that's the walk away like you walk away from the book different because it because in in this case your book says something interesting and you kind of have to respond to interesting things things that are right you're like yeah that's right i agree with it things that are interesting you're like well how am i gonna assimilate this into my own thought right yeah yeah and i think like one of the things and i think an important um, part of this for me, and I've seen it modeled in like real life, which is really great, um, uh, is like not getting caught up in the question of critique, and oh, like yeah. using your book as a as a as a space to like spar with others, but to like use what you can and keep it moving, right? Like, and you know, I think there's a whole many generations of scholars who are like who know that their job as a critic is to is to fight, you know, it's like you know knives out, and then there's a and then I've seen modeled for me in these really amazing ways um, how you can do your um, you can do your work without tearing down other people's um, ideas yeah. and like building on uh, on good stuff and, and pointing people in in the direction of folks who who you find important right in in the conversation um, and I think that's very much also in in many of your books you know multiple. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I would I, I I I would love what you're talking about to become uh, the sort of gold standard of scholarship because it's just so much more interesting when people feel liberated from that sparring. You know, it's like yeah, <laughs> it can be fun sort of historically to see how these people. What, but really, in the end, like what are passions about writing and thinking that edify yeah. us and uplift us? And I think it's got to come from you know, decolonial love as a, as a, as a writerly practice. Yeah. yeah. So let me turn that question uh, that I just asked as a sort of final question um, to you, you know, how do you walk away from this book? And I, I mean, you can talk about your next project. Everybody has a next project, but you know, people don't always want to like, you know, you've had some time to breathe with this book, I guess, but uh, yeah. it's always hard to be like, what's next. Um, yeah. But I think it mean, I mean it in a, in a deep way as well of how do you walk away from the book, you know, how has it formed and changed your own scholarly vision going forward? Yeah, I mean, I definitely am working on something new now, but I do want to say first that I end the book with this moment, um, this opportunity that I had to bring these writers from Equatorial Guinea to Puerto Rico during Festival de la Palabra. This is the largest literary festival in Puerto Rico. It doesn't exist anymore after the hurricane, but um but it was the year before the hurricane and I was able to bring these writers to Puerto Rico to present their work all over the island, uh, to present in public, to read with children, right? Like it was incredible. And then at the end, when it was over, I was able to take them on like a tour and bring them to all these different places and, and to build a different kind of relationship and say like, um, you know, it's not just about the work, but it's about who we are as people and, and to trying to build community across the Atlantic in some ways. Um, but then also for them to see the kind of the landscape um, yeah. that I was thinking of when I was in Ecuador again, I was in their hometown, you know, and, and with their families um, and their folks. And then they can come and see like our rainforest and our right town. And yeah. so that resonance of them being like, oh, whoa, whoa, like this is, I can, I see this, you know, like this feels just like, you know, um, uh, Revola. this feels just like our, my forest, you know, um, was this kind of incredible moment where the book left me um, in thinking about that and, and being able to do that. Um, and then, um, in, in part of that and that very same trip, um, I started to work on a very, on a new project, which is the project that I'm working on now, which was one, you know, I started off by saying like, I went to grad school to do a, a project on Puerto Ricans, black Puerto Rican literature, black Puerto Rican studies. And then I took this departure to do this like hemispheric and transnational and Atlantic diasporic project. 
And then here I am turning back again, back to my original question, which is Black Puerto Rican studies, like Black Puerto Ricans um, and the histories of survival, um, the histories of their uh, displacement and erasure from both um, the national imaginary as well as from the official archives um, um, and then experiences in the diaspora around questions of like arson and displacement, um, questions of documentary photography and film and the ways that um, the attention to and the kind of proof of survival exists not in the archive, but in these other kind of self-created, you know, um, uh, projects, this autopoiesis mm-hmm. and us mm-hmm. digging it up um, b- becomes such an important part of it. So it's um, it's a book that is really um, inspired both by my own familial history, as well as by these incredible documentary projects, uh, photography projects or history projects and documentary films, um, as well as some of the kind of archives um, of uh, arson in, in, in Hoboken, New Jersey, um, that have helped me to come up with a project that actually has not one thing to do with literature at all, but everything to do with what Frank Espada would call the survival of a people, right? Um, and so that is that is where I'm moving towards um, in this project. And, and the other part of it is having um, it be an accessible book, one that is like academic and not, right? Um, it has an uh. academic sensibility about it, but written for a public like my own family who could be able to read it, you know? Um, and um, and then also has uh, some other kinds of public facing projects that would serve um, to better um, preserve some of these histories um, in mm-hmm. different places. Um, so whether it is like memorializing murals or if it's like um, creating a repository of like oral histories that's available, so the project itself has all of these different aspects to it. Um, and I'm really excited. It's kind of like the, like I'm being propelled right towards this project um, after writing Decolonizing Diasporas and thinking about, well, what are the ways that I can um, then turn to the intimate, the personal, the political um, in a different kind of way. And definitely, like definitely when I talk about like my family being able to read the book, I'm definitely talking about like the the LOL messages I've gotten from some of my family members that are like, girl, what are you talking about? Who's the Santa phone? <laughs> like, what is that? Is that a new tablet? Yeah. You know, like. <laughs> Just add um, a new tablet. So, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I was like, okay, I, I hear y'all. You know what I'm saying? I get it. And the next one is for y'all, you know? So, <laughs> so that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I mean, it's, it's an amazing project that, you know, I'm sure it's going to have multiple branches and iterations. And I just, I love the ambition of that, you know, all the things that will come uh, from it. Well, I loved your book. I'm so happy you made the time. Uh, I know your book's gotten a a good amount of attention. I hope eyes keep on it. I think it's one one of the few transformative books I've read in the last decade. And uh, the more eyes on it and the more people work from the ideas citation but also the way you change sensibilities for so many of us as readers Um, i really love that and i really look forward to the next project but also i look forward to the sort of yomira effect on our shared fields in caribbean and black atlantic (laughs) studies i really mean that i'm not just saying oh man that is so this is like this is amazing it's such a great conversation thank you so much the questions are incredible and um and I'm really appreciate. I'm really appreciate it. You know, like I'm not kidding when I say like I don't know what to do with like you know once the book is out in the world and how it's received and who reads it and 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 why and all that stuff. Like it just boggles my mind. So I'm something very thankful. Thank you, John. All right. Well, take care, Yomara. Yeah. Have a good one. <laughs> <laughs>